Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfelt. You're watching Back to the Bible Canada. We're doing a study of five very influential men and women in the Bible and their life lessons, and that is how we in our own walk of faith can learn from their lives and apply some of the lessons that they learn to ourselves. And so today, I want to talk about Moses. Uh, it was early on in our lives, all of us that went to school, we had the same lesson in geometry, and it went something like this. We know that the shortest distance between two points is, yeah, a straight line, straight line. But in God's geometry, it doesn't seem he thinks that way. Because sometimes when God is taking his people to a given point, he doesn't lead us in the shortest distance. He leads us in a series of circles where it seems for a while, look, we're not even getting anywhere. Um, that's what I want to talk about, and that's the life lesson we're going to learn from the life of Moses. So let me start by saying this. God has caused every single believer in Jesus to believe that he has a destiny for us. Evidence, Ephesians 1.4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Yeah. Or how about this? Romans 8.17. Now, if we are children, that is children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. See, God has promised us that we will rule over all the works of his hands in eternity. He has created us with a holy destiny. I mean, if you're in Christ, your life is heading somewhere that's ultimately joyful and purposeful. So I, I want us to keep that in mind as we begin to go. Now, as a way of getting to the introduction to this or helping us you know, get into the Moses story, let me give an example of how sometimes, I mean, we hear the holy destiny of God and then we look at you know, the reality of where we are in our lives and we say to ourselves, it just doesn't seem that way in terms of how I'm living. So imagine, if you will, a businessman. And uh, this businessman is starting a new business and uh, he's a believer and uh, he's been on his knees and he has said, Lord, in this business, I want to dedicate this business to the glory of God. Everything is dedicated to you. He reminds himself that Christ himself said that he who is faithful in little will be put in charge of much. So he believes this is a test to be faithful in the little that God has entrusted to him. And so he's got some plans in his mind. I mean, one of the things he says, he's going to make sure that everybody who works for him or the customers that he have will in some way come in contact with the love of God through Jesus. So that's a big part of his business. And then the second part of his business, he says, is also going to be that. I mean, whatever profits that I make, I'm going to make sure that a number of them are profits that are given for the advancement of the gospel and ministry of the poor. So he's got that in his heart. So this business is God's business, he says. And then comes the reality. You know what I'm talking about, especially those of you who are business people. The reality looks like this. Uh, there are times as the business is getting going, he's struggling to pay his bills. And he is desperate not to get into a situation of unmanageable debt. So, you know, there may be opportunities out there, but he says to himself, Am I, I'd love to grab that opportunity. Can I... Or will this swamp the, the business that I've already begun? And then there's a downturn in the economy. And then he finds out that he needs to know more than he thought he knew uh, about accounting and uh, about hiring staff and about calculating things like e employee benefits and what are workers' rights uh, in his job. He needs to know how to delegate work properly so that, you know, he's a boss that can be followed. I mean, how does he, you know, estimate a new job that he's applying for? I mean, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things. There's so much to learn and there's so many challenges before him. He is swamped in the mountain of minutia that he has to deal with on a daily basis. He forgets that holy destiny that he thought this was all about. It seems to him like he's just going in circles and he's not on his way to that holy destiny at all, you see. Uh, some of you know, you know, we put in your own experiences, whatever it is, into that framework and, and you say, well, yeah, I've had that very same experience. So somewhere along the line, you know, it seems like we need to re-get uh, this sense of the grand mission, not only of what we're doing, but the grand mission of our lives. What's that all about? So let's learn from the life of Moses. That's what I promised. So let's dive right in. So I'm reading Exodus chapter uh, 13, verses 17 to, to 22, which is the end of the chapter. So here we go. 
It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, say, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etam on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Okay, that's just the text, and I'm going to build on that, but that's the basis upon which I want to start. Let's see if we can imagine what we have just read. So I've been talking about some of the great men and women of the Bible, so I want us to learn from Moses today. And Moses, as you know, if you think about Moses, whatever you know about him, I mean, think about the kind of attributes that you might think about when you think about his name. Great leader, yeah, great prophet of God, the man who climbed the sacred mountain of God and saw God face to face, and God spoke to him as with a friend. Wow. Moses, the great lawgiver. Moses, the great military general. Moses, the great leader, even in moments of crisis. Moses, the man who's steadfast and who has his eyes fixed upon the goal, regardless of the crisis of the moment. I mean, that's, I know those are attributes, and I think that all of them aptly are applied to Moses' life. So you think about all of that. So, and yet, here we are, when we think about Moses, let me also say this is also true. Moses led the people of Israel going around in circles for 40 years. They wandered in an unbearably hot desert. They ate the same food every morning for breakfast, then for lunch, and then for dinner. It was always the same menu. Uh, while he was promising them that before them was a land of milk and honey, and it continued that way until the whole generation died in the desert. And that's where Moses died as well. So is that still leadership? Is that still the great man? I mean, what is it to a man who was leading his people around in circles over and over again, giving them the promise of a promised land? And I think there's a picture here for all of us. And the picture is this. You know, Israel has just witnessed something profound, and that's the Exodus event. Uh, they've been led out of slavery in Egypt. And, and for us who you know, read the account as we read through Exodus, and you know, it's, it's now you know, over 3,500 years later, and yet we now know that this is one of the most important events in the history of our faith, and I would argue one of the most important events in the history of the world. And, and it's so important for us to remember that God had revealed his splendor to a slave nation, the nation of Israel. So please understand that this is the picture. Uh, Moses has been in exile. He's come to Egypt. He is God's prophet. He's armed with nothing but the power of God. Pharaoh hardens his heart. Moses sends 10 plagues down on Egypt. It devastates Egypt and humbles them, and he leads them out of the wilderness. I mean, he, he, he showcases the power of God to lead his people to the promised land. And then later on, when we get to the book of Deuteronomy, which is, you know, at the end of Moses' life, uh, we are told, um, or Israel is told, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And by the way, how can you possibly doubt that? I mean, after everything that God has done, and uh, not only what he did by breaking the power of Egypt and then uh, you know, drowning the Egyptian army in the Red Sea, and then taking them to, the, to the, the, the sacred mountain where they heard the voice of God and all the other miracles that occurred along the way. I mean, how could they doubt that they were the treasured possession of God? And might I add this? If you're a follower of Jesus, how can you doubt that either? And did not God, the great God of heaven, do something beyond what he had done for Israel for you? That is, God sent his only son, 
to be the atoning sacrifice for your sins. Your sins were nailed onto Christ's cross. Christ rose from the dead for you to give you the promise that you, like him, are going to rise from the dead and you'll be forever with the Lord, ruling and reigning with Christ for all of eternity. Christ is the sign for you that you're a holy nation, a treasured possession of God. See, that's, that's how our story is similar to this story. But then as we read through the Exodus event, we, we, there's a curious twist. There's an ominous sign of what lies ahead. Exodus 13, 17. I'll read it again. It says, God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot in that sentence. So they've just come out of, you know, out of Egypt, and they're heading towards the promised land, and the shortest road would have been a well-established roadway that traveled from Egypt right you know, uh, on the, uh, right beside the Mediterranean Sea, straight to the promised land. It was a short destination. They could have traveled that in anywhere from two weeks to a month, and then they would have arrived in the promised land, and then they would have had a land filled with milk and honey. They'd been living in large houses in a productive land. They would have set up secure borders, and they would have established the laws of God in their nation. I mean, that should have been it. One month later, after coming out of Egypt, they'd have had their own nation, and they would have been that great nation that they all knew that they were destined to become. Doesn't work that way. And that's the whole point of the entire story of the Exodus and, and beyond. Uh, the, the way of the Philistines uh, that is spoken about in our Bible, well, it in fact, it came with a great many dangers. That roadway was an easily passable one, but along the roadway would have been a series of Egyptian fortresses where the Egyptian army would have come out at any moment to try to stop anyone who was traveling that roadway without permission. So it's a, it's, a, it's a protected highway, and it would also have been a route which the Philistines would have come out immediately and have gone to war for anyone coming into their territory that was unwanted. In other words, if Israel, the whole nation of them, would have traveled that roadway, they would have been in a massive fight for their lives immediately. And here's what God says. It says, if they see what is ahead, they will soon change their minds and head back to Egypt. It'll terrify them. See, I, I, this is the important point. So instead of leading them on that roadway, God leads them down into the wilderness. Now, I'm not going to answer the question, is exactly the route by which the Exodus took. So imagine with me that it was straight up like this to go from Egypt up into Canaan, which was the promised land. But instead of doing that, so I imagine here my two fingers are lifted up. And uh, so you imagine that <clears throat> these two fingers are the two arms of the Red Sea that's coming up. Now, there's a, there's a disagreement among some scholars as to whether or not, you know, Israel would have crossed over on, on this side. And let's say that here is the Sinai Peninsula in the middle or on this side. And I'm not going to solve that. But however it is, the Bible makes it very clear, they are led, and I'm just going to say for argument's sake, they're led here to cross uh, over here, over here, and then they're going to come to, to Mount Sinai. And when they're led down into the Sinai Peninsula, they're suddenly walled in, and suddenly it looks like there's no way out. They're, they're, in, they're in, a, in a place where there is, you know, it's a cul-de-sac. And after Israel had come out of Egypt, because Egypt has been devastated by, you know, the ten plagues that God has sent, Pharaoh has sent spies to report back to him. So runners are constantly coming back to him and says, where are these people now? And they come back and say they're hemmed in by the wilderness. And it seems like they're not clear where they're going to go. They're wandering around in circles, and it doesn't look like their God is interested in them anymore. Uh, so from our perspective, let, let me try to explain that. To the Egyptians, the gods and goddesses were, were fickle. Uh, they would take interest in you for a moment and, you know, do their will in, in, in your life, but they may get bored of you and they might just desert you. 
And uh, the, so the Egyptians didn't have this concept of the, the faithful God of Israel. That, they didn't know about that. All they could see is, yeah, the God of Israel absolutely devastated us and just pounded us out. But on the same time, now God doesn't seem to show any interest because look at these people are, are in the wilderness now and they're wandering around in circles. They don't seem to know what they're doing. So Pharaoh listens to his advisors and they say, let's go after them. And, um, and I think that God had th three things in mind. Number one, God was going to finally and ultimately humble the Egyptian army by drowning them in the Red Sea. The second thing that God had in mind is that he was going to show Israel his greatness and his power. So they'd never forget. It wasn't that they hadn't seen enough yet. You know, they'd seen the 10 plagues, but it wasn't enough. They needed to see that God could take on the most powerful military on earth, and it wasn't even a, a match. A and the third thing here is that God wanted to take them down into the wilderness so that they could come to a mountain, Mount Sinai, and there they would learn both how to worship and they would learn the law of God. They would learn what adoration of the one true God actually looked like. So, that came with building a tabernacle and all of the implements for worship and what worship, how you were to approach God properly. And they would also learn that God is a righteous God, a moral God, and that God demands his people be a righteous people. So here are the laws of God. So they leave Egypt. God devastates the Egyptian army. Then he leads them into the wilderness to Mount Sinai. They're going to spend two years there, rather than, you know, in one month being into the promised land, they're going to spend two years around the mountain and they're going to learn the ways of God. So I'm going to say a couple of things about this. God sometimes takes us through detours. Sometimes we need to backtrack. Sometimes we need to circle. Sometimes things come into our lives that we don't understand because he knows that if we simply go in a straight line, we're not going to make it. We're going to be overwhelmed by warfare. We're going to be terrified by what we see. So he doesn't take us in a straight line. He rather takes us in a circular, circuitous route so that we will learn to banish the idols in our lives, that we'll learn to worship God and honor him as we rightly should, and also have our faith in him. But when we're going around in circles, this can be frustrating, this can be painful, this can be unwanted, and we might cry out to God and say, I don't understand. I thought I was going to the promised land, but it doesn't seem like I'm going there at all. It doesn't seem like I'm going anywhere. See, that would have been the experience of Israel, and I'm going to say, I think there are a great many people in their own Christian lives, they have that exact same feeling. It didn't just happen that way 3,500 years ago. It did, but it also happens that way in individual lives as they seek, as people seek, as followers of Jesus to be faithful to them. At times, it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere. Okay, I've made that point. So, let me suggest a couple of things. I have heard, and I've seen a number of reports, and I've read a number of these, uh, in which they have tracked lottery winners. So, I'm, I like to say on the outset, I'm opposed to the lottery. I don't think you should be buying any. I don't think that God wants you to get rich quick. I think that God wants you to serve him and to work hard with your own hands and learn to share. I mean, I think that's God's plan for our lives. I, I just advise you as a believer, stay away from the whole stuff. I think it's all based on greed. But having said all of that, I've seen these reports from lottery winners, and by far the majority of them, after five years, are far worse off than they were before they bought or won the lottery. Now think about that. I say there's always two tragedies in life. One is that you never win the lottery, so you spent all that money for nothing. The other is that you win the lottery, and so your life becomes um, painful and bitter, and you don't know how to handle money properly, and all this kind of stuff, and people take advantage of you. I mean, those are the reports over and over again. That is, if you didn't learn to make money the hard way, to earn it honestly with your own hands. If it suddenly just came out of heaven and just landed in your lap, you wouldn't know what to do with it. Now, I know people say, I sure would. I wouldn't be like that. And that's what they all say. 
So I, I want to say that it's also true in terms of our spiritual resources. Look, God is going to give us the wealth of his kingdom. I mean, just let that sink in for a while. But he knows that you're just like Israel. You can't handle that. And so God is going to take you on a securitous route. And so let me suggest, therefore, five things. And, uh, and these five things that we need to learn about what Israel needed to learn. And we can learn from them as well. So here that we go. The first thing that Israel needed to learn. God knew that Israel had to lose their slave mentality. See, there is something about a nation that had been in slavery for over 400 years and they had become to think of themselves as slaves and not as a great nation of God. You see, Moses found a band of slaves. He he was called to be their leader, take them to the promised land, but in their hearts, their hearts remained in Egypt. Exodus 14, 10 and 11. It says, you know, in their first brush with conflict, and that was at the Red Sea, and uh, listen to what the passage says. It says, when Pharaoh drew near, The people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said then to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Ah, That was their first reaction. We're all going to die. Nobody can defeat this army. Who are we? We're just a band of slaves. Moses, why did you bring us out here? This is the moment of our slaughter. They thought the worst in their hearts. They didn't say, wait a minute, God prefers our nation to theirs. We're not going to lose this fight because if God is on our side, who can be against us? They weren't talking that way. They were talking the way slaves would talk. They felt pressure. See, they doubted the power of God. Uh, You know, when you're a slave, your future is not in your own hands. And so you always end up being helpless. Now, let me say something on on a practical note on this matter. We live in a culture in which whining has reaching epic proportions. I mean, I think the entire Western world has become you know, a, a culture that majors on victimhood. It's almost like we've elevated the status of victimhood. I mean, you're nobody unless you're a victim. <laughs> you know, And so let me give some examples of that. Uh, for instance, think about all the frivolous lawsuits, both in, you know, in our country, in Canada, and in the U.S. And I'll give you some examples. Here's an example of a man who sued a bicycle manufacturer. You know, after he, he had an accident on his bicycle while going downhill. He said the bicycle manufacturer had failed to warn him that the bicycle would pick up speed going downhill. (laughs) You know, nobody told me. I mean, how could I have known? I'm a victim. You see, they're responsible for my accident. Now, here's another. It's a father who sued a son's hockey league for not giving his son the Player of the Year award. Father said his son had his heart set on it. Failure to win it had damaged his son's sense of self-worth. Oh, the poor kid. You know, he didn't say, kid, you know what? Just keep working at it. You need to, you know, you need, we need to get tougher. Uh, No, no. He said, oh, son, this was terrible. Yeah, but we take these people to court. Uh, Consider this. West Virginia convenience store worker was awarded a whopping $2 million in punitive damages after she injured her back opening a pickle jar. And according to a report in the Charleston Daily Mail, <laughs> yeah. You know, she just wrenched her back. Well, I guess the jar was on too tight, and that's the fault of the manufacturer. Listen to this. A woman whose name I'm not going to mention lest, you know, she hears about this and sues me, she filed a $50 million lawsuit against Robert's Food, is the maker of a snack food. Here's what the woman claimed that she had become fat from eating junk food. She was claiming emotional distress and mental anguish because the weight she had gained uh, was because she had become hooked on junk food. And uh, so on and on it goes. You know, we've become a nation of whiners. Uh, We blame everyone for who we are. We blame parents. We blame school teachers. We blame our bosses. We blame society as a whole. We blame the police. We blame politicians. Everyone around us is to blame because we have been made a victim by all these forces so large and they're imposing on us and who we are. And, you know, we're just a, a group of whimperers. Now, listen, mature believers don't panic. When things go badly, we trust. We look to God. 
we see the Egyptian army moving in and saying, I'm going to wipe you out, we'll simply say, it's time for us to learn the lessons that God has for us. What will God do? What will be the lessons? But let's go forward in courage. But at this point in time, if God had simply taken Israel up to Canaan, then at that juncture, I'm going to tell you, they would have still been a slave nation. They'd have had their own nation, but any time, any time trouble would have arisen, they would have acted like slaves, not like the treasured possession of God. That slave nation status needed to be uprooted from their hearts, and might I say, it needs to be taken from our hearts as well. Okay, that's point number one. Here's point number two. God knew for Israel that they were not prepared for battle. That's already been said. Verse 17 said that. In fact, if Israel had taken the road to the Philistines, they'd have had one battle after another along the way, and they were not prepared for it. Um, And and I want to say a couple of things about that. Um, There are a great many Christians that I meet today who are utterly gobsmacked. They are overwhelmed when they find out that the Christian life isn't going to be easy street, that there are going to be a series of conflicts along the way, that they're going to have to fight in the name of Jesus and remain loving, and remain winsome, and remain uh, willing to reach out even to those who do harm. Listen to what Ephesians 6 verse 12 says. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against people, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, if you're a believer, welcome to the field of battle. Satan and his demons and all the hosts of wickedness are arrayed against you, and you're going to have to learn to fight and stand strong on the day of the Lord. Stop falling down and crawling into a a ball and whimpering, but rather strap on the weapons of your warfare and go into the fight for the glory of God. See, Israel wasn't ready for that, and many of us are not ready for that as well. So it seems like we're wandering around in circles. I'm going to come back to that because we're not yet ready for the fight. Number three, God also knows. So again, number one was you know, the slave mentality. We got to lose that. Number two, we got to learn warfare. Number three, God knows and God knew that Israel needed to learn to grow and to mature in him. God's intention, God's intention was to take Israel to the promised land. You know, they're going to go, however, first of all, to to Mount Sinai. They're going to go into the wilderness and for two years, they would be at the mountain of God. It's so fascinating because even Jesus, before he, the sinless one, the one who needs no correction, the one could have gone directly into his public ministry, spends 40 days out in the wilderness, and he is being tempted by the evil one. God is preparing him for his task. And the reality is all of us need to spend time in the wilderness. We need to spend time when it seems like we're not being fruitful and we're not making an impact. And I've seen this over and over again. I have seen um, individuals, whether you know they're pastors or other individuals in some field of endeavor, and it seems like you know all of the, the the big victories happened early on, and they're launched onto a stage of publicity, and it seems like a great many of them will just simply collapse. Uh, that is something. Well, they're just not ready for that kind of stardom. They're not ready for that measure of success. God knows that about us. God's not foolish. He understands what needs to happen within us. We need to learn how to trust in him. We need to learn to walk humbly. You know, I, I remember one pastor saying he's learned what to do with all the compliments he gets. He says, I treat them like perfume. I sniff them and they, yes, they, they, they smell nice, but I never drink it. I never internalize that and assume that's who I am. He says, because It's not who I am. People see me in one role, standing in front of the pulpit and preaching, and they feed me with these accolades, but but they don't see me in my hours of of struggle, in my hours when I'm learning patience with my kids and with my spouse and all of those other things that make up my life. So we need all to mature and to grow. Number four, God knows that we need to learn the hard lessons of obedience. So here's the thing for the believer. We need to know what it is to say no to our wanter, 
our flesh, the thing that we desire. I, I, this is what I desire. I want a big house. I want a big car. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. We look around and it seems like our list of wants just never end. Instead, God wants us to learn first and foremost that the greatest reward is bending the knee in humility before him and learning obedience. So for Israel, they came to the the sacred mountain. God appears to them and gives them the Ten Commandments. They're not the Ten Suggestions. They're commands from God. God says, keep the Sabbath. God says, don't commit adultery. God says, don't steal. Honor your father and mother. Don't you dare have any idols or any gods outside of me. And God gives his commandments and tells them, learn to live this way. Learn to live in obedience. And, uh, you know, we need to do that too. Um, So number five, God knows that we have to walk by faith. And perhaps one of the hardest lessons that Israel learned is after the two years at Mount Sinai, they were then on their way to the Promised Land. And we come to that incident two years after the Exodus. It's in Numbers 13 and 14. They've come to a place in the wilderness called Kadesh Barnea, and it is at the edge of Canaan, the Promised Land that God had promised to give them. They send spies into the land. The spies go into the land. The spies come out and they say, oh man, oh, this is, you know, there, there's, there, there are strong peoples. They're going to wipe us out. And it sounds like they've learned no lessons whatsoever. And so then they have this horrible moment in which they rebel against God. They're angry. They say to God, why did you bring us out in the desert so that we might die out here? Wouldn't it be better if we had just stayed in Egypt as slaves and not gone on this harebrained adventure, believing that we were a special people on the way to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey? None of that was ever going to happen. God, you deceived us. So, you know, that's what happened to Kadesh Barnea. And because of the rebellion, they ended up in the desert for another 38 years wandering around in circles. Now, you need to take that to heart. I mean, sometimes because we refuse the discipline of God in our lives, uh, we end up going over the same ground over and over, and God never releases us until we learn the lessons that he has for us in a given place. And even if you have to go through the same lesson, you know, 10 times, 20 times, 100 times, thank God for every time you go over that same lesson because God is preparing you. Now, in the case of that generation, you know, the 38 years, there was a whole generation of unbelievers who never entered into the promised land because they simply refused the lessons that God had for them. And the book of Hebrews says, don't be like that. I mean, don't allow within you an evil and an unbelieving heart that that despises the promises of God. Instead, take God at his word, believe deeply, even though things in the moment don't make sense. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. You probably don't, but he does. That's the lesson that we're to learn. Now, I want to say a couple of things. There are two important promises that we need to concentrate on. The first one comes from Exodus 13, verse 19. It says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. That is, when they came out of Egypt, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Bury me in the promised land. So Moses takes the bones of Joseph and says, listen, no matter what happens, We're going to the promised land. And so that's the first lesson that we're going to learn. No matter what our experience has been, no matter the reversals of fortune, no matter the hardships that we encounter along the way, no matter how often it seems like, am I really going somewhere in my life? Is this whole thing really about a holy destiny? Could you remember this? If God made you promises in Christ and then cemented those promises, with the death and with the resurrection of Jesus and the promises he has made for you, would you just hold on to them and don't let go? Just grip hold tightly and say, I may not be able to make sense out of my common experience. I know that God knows what this is about, even though I don't, but I believe this. I am on the way to a holy destiny and nothing can stop that from happening, no matter how many times I go in circles. Start with that. And then secondly, also recognize that God had given Israel something very beautiful. You know, the passage that we have read talks about, you know, a pillar of, of, uh, a pillar of cloud by day 
and a pillar of fire by night. I mean, all day long and all night, God kept giving Israel signs of his presence. Manna came to them every day and fed them. It's no different with us. God has given us his Holy Spirit. God has put his Holy Spirit inside of us, who is a guarantee of that which will come. Trust in the leading of the Holy Spirit, for he will never forsake you, and he will continue to remind you of the presence of Christ. And so what do you do when you're going in circles? Remember Moses. Remember the story of Moses. It's a long, torturous, complicated journey, but it ends up where this journey should end up. In the end of the day, Israel stepped foot in the promised land, and God kept every one of his promises. He'll do that with you. Hey, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible. Today, put your hope in Christ today. Would you do that? Amen. Thank you for watching today. And I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.